Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. You just took that whole thing without water? I did. That whole thing. Yeah, I almost coughed it right back up. <laughs> it was really hard. It was like it was a cinnamon <laughs> challenge with a nootropic. Oh, that was my a gosh. bad idea. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Human Factors Cast. It's episode 118. It's uh, January 28th. <gasps> I know. Where did the time go? It's almost one whole month into this new year, uh, 2019, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, hello, uh, Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. How's everybody doing? Hey, there he is. Woo! Uh, we got a lot to talk about today. We got um, some pod projection tech that signals uh, driverless cars' intentions. Five innovations to show how good design can make the world more inclusive. Woo. Oh, oh, who would have guessed this one? Screen time inhibit, inhibits toddler development. I never would have thought, man. Go figure. And one quarter of jobs are at high risk of being automated. We'll get to all that. Uh, but first, welcome to our new listeners. We typically pick up a lot of you towards the beginning of the year. Um, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a new year, so it's a new chance for you guys to get out there, go to some conferences, and... Uh, you know, do all that stuff. All that kind of good stuff. It's that time of year. Get it's, ready and get prepped. It's it's that time of year. Uh, p- put in your New Year's resolutions to go to a conference, network with at least 10 people, um, and uh, go check us out on YouTube and subscribe. There you because, go. Because uh, that, that could be a New Year's resolution, too. Tell your friends. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's not a whole lot going on, but there's a couple conferences coming up this year. Please go check them out. Um, and report back because we always like to hear what's going on for sure and if you want to go to any conferences that we're not able to make it to let us know that you're going yes. we'd love to talk about it on the show have you on the show to talk about it with us we've done it before we'll do it again we'll do it again uh okay blake hey you, hey, Nick. you, you have some exciting things here in the, in the banter section no it's it's literally like <laughs> rant rage banter that i've thought about so i don't know where we talked about this on. we probably talked about it on infinite but I, so i've been having to use a lot of electrolyte supplements Okay. And so every time I buy one of these tiny tubs, there's a very, very small spoon that is hidden in the bottom of one of these tubs. Oh, isn't that the worst? And I just can't stand it. I don't know how, like, because so, a lot of these companies, like, they have human factors people in them, but, like, I don't know if they just are not involved with a lot of the main product lines or what it is or what they do in the company. It could be that they just don't work on these specific problems. But I've noticed across every supplement I've ever taken, it'll come with, like, a spoon or a scoop. But it's hidden within the powder. Okay, I, I'm gonna stop you there because I can't remember what brand it was, but they make their spoons in like a little twistable insert. So like you know the, where you twist off the plastic piece from the actual thing. Yeah, yeah. They hide that within the cap, which is where it should be. Which is where it should be. Just and you just put it there. You just wiggle it off the cap, and then boom, you have your cup. Scoop. Yeah, yep, and then exactly. it's not like hidden in there. You don't lose whatever expensive powder you've bought. In. Yeah, I don't know. So that's just a, a gripe more than a banter thing. Yeah. But I've, I've thought about that a lot recently. I was like, I need to start my own supplement company that just specializes in making, you know, the, the tubs, the tub, <laughs> the tub and the uh, other people cap. can fill it with stuff. Yeah. You just want to make the tubs. put stuff in it. I'll just do it. Yeah. Uh, and, so and then you could pr- provide like ROI. Like, hey, look, I'm, my users turn on investment. Uh, you know, my users bought less of your product because they weren't digging around in their because yeah, they weren't losing <laughs> half of it. Just trying to find the spoon. So really, the, you're losing. An it's really a marketing ploy. Yeah. yeah. Negative um, ROI. What's going on with you, Nicholas? Oh man, so Big okay. Weekend last week, yeah, it was. So uh, I, I don't remember if I talked about this on the show or if it was on Infinite or what. But my whole, I feel, I feel like I've heard that before. Yeah, hmm. um, I, my whole birthday plan is every year um, to just kind of do what I want and no, you know, no limitations. If it costs X amount of money, I'll go and do it if I feel like it. Uh, and so this year came around, and my partner was basically like, "Well, what do you want to do this year?" And I said. You know what? I kind of want to just clean this room, so we cleaned the room. I spent like seventy dollars on uh, on uh, on tubs and organization things, and now the room is like sparkly clean. And we Marie Kondoed that thing up. So you adulted hard. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, um, I've been Marie Kondoing myself. Have you? Yeah, Lisa's been watching it, and so now I have to fold all my clothes that way, and oh. it is super helpful. See, so the way I organize my clothes because like T-shirts, uh, socks, and underwear. And pants, like I don't really fold those. Those are not things that I fold. So what really? I have, what do you do with them? So here's what I do. 
So I have these tubs on the bottom of my closet that I just throw my t-shirts in, throw my socks and underwear in, and then throw my pants in. Because again, you know, unless they're slacks, like I don't need to iron them or whatever. They're just jeans. So I'll just throw them in. So in the morning, I can just blindly reach into one of these tubs and grab a pair of socks or grab, you know, some underwear or t-shirt or whatever. Um, no and, problem. You know, all my, all my shirts are hung up, like button up shirts are hung up ab- above them. So that's kind of how I organize my space. That's kind of cool. It's a little grab bag in the morning. Yeah. Grab bag of clothes. I really like it too because it makes, you know, uh, laundry a lot more efficient. I can just say, oh, this goes there, throw it in, throw it in, throw it in. And then it's like I, I'm done in half the time as opposed to if I wanted to fold everything. Yeah, see, I fold all my stuff because I've got way too many goofy-ass T-shirts that I keep around. Yeah, you should wear some on the show. I should. Yeah. I, I wear them on some of my other things that I do. <laughs> but So I keep to try to keep it professional in here. Yeah. Like I you know, have a job and stuff. Yeah, I guess. There That's is one other. Smart. I, like the, I like that idea of the tubs. I might be getting some tubs. Yeah, it's, uh, you know. They they sell them at any department store, just five bucks or whatever. Just Do they have them. the appropriate spoons and lids? No, no spoons mm-hmm. on these ones because they don't come with powder. No they good. came with powder. No good. Uh, I, d- I do have to talk about one other thing. So do it. Um, I guess it was right after that, the 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 day after my birthday, I actually uh, went out and we were going to take all these clothes to Goodwill, and um, you know, I I get like almost to my car and then I trip over falling in pain and because my ankle had snapped uh about 90 degrees to my leg and why do we not have a sound effect for that i know right i, I feel like there oh, might cha. be there we go <laughs> that was the sound of my leg cracking um and so uh i i basically like couldn't drive anywhere i couldn't do anything for the entire weekend so my entire weekend my entire birthday weekend was spent indoors playing video games with your feet up with my feet up crushing it yeah it, <laughs> I just it, like I I feel for anybody who like lacks mobility because oh, I was sure. I was upset about not being able to get in my cardio and like keep the momentum going from the new year starting and eating and exercising right and, you know all that stuff I was I was upset about that but someone like we've talked about these accessibility uh, devices on the show where you can like think a thought and it will you know write that on the screen and so like I have no room to complain because I sprained my ankle. 100%. And you can always go to the gym and just do the uh the Yeah, yeah, prank. except I look like a dope with that. That's all right. I'll anyway. come do it with you. It'll be funny. All right. Uh do you have anything else? I don't, man. What are we going to do? Well, I don't know. That's that's it for today. Let's get out of here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, you guys. I'm kidding. We're not we're not there yet. This is uh Human Factors News. It's part of st- <laughs> we, we break down all the stories coming out of the field of Human Factors anything from uh let's see what do we got today we got pod projections so pod. autonomous vehicles uh design you know any as long as it relates to the field of human factors it's fair game uh blake what do we got up first this week all right up first so we got these pods that nick's been talking about so many pedestrians still don't trust self-driving cars even though they know they're there so jaguar R- land rover has developed something that could be at least a partial solution to that problem in the form of a projected light bars <laughs> that announce when the autonomous what the autonomous vehicle is about to do the technology was recently tested in the indoor simulated street in coventry U- in the coventry uk by autonomous pod zero electric vehicles so each of the pods is projected projects a series of horizontally stacked light bars onto the road surface in front of itself and so when the vehicle starts to accelerate the gaps between these light bars would widen and conversely those gaps will likewise shrink as the pod starts to break while while (laughs) while they would fan out to left or right to indicate that somebody's turning you know left or right so a team of engineers working with cognitive psychologists assessed how the system affected the trust levels of pedestrians who were crossing the street in front of pods jaguar land rover has not yet shared these findings on its technology but hopefully will in the coming months i'm sure there's a bunch of pr stuff that kind of holds that up but so, Nick, we've talked about this a super long time ago, this concept being like in a research concept of putting a light bar on top of cars and trying to indicate to a pedestrian what it's doing. And yeah. now it looks like Jaguar Jaguar Land Rover has taken it, applied it, and is actually doing you know simulated testing. Yeah, I think the cool thing about this is it's not just uh, uh, on-the-car signals. It's They are actually projecting the path of the vehicle in front of them and so if you're a pedestrian walking alongside one of these vehicles, you can actually see uh, at what rate and how, uh, w- what direction the, um, 
the pod is planning to go. So that's which, cool. Which is kind of cool because it's showing you like enough light bars out front. I was just wondering though, we live in sunny Southern California. How's it going to play out during the middle of the day? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's another hurdle that obviously we have to overcome. But maybe maybe someday. And my hope is that you know we'll all be equipped with these augmented reality glasses, and we'll all be able to see all the pathways of all the automated vehicles if we just patch into this like mega net or whatever we want to call it yeah the hive mind it'll be hanging out yeah yeah i mean i think there's kind of fun ways to get around it I, i'm glad that they're actually testing it and are aware of the fact that they've got to do something that's going to make people feel at least a little bit more safe with these kind of vehicles out there that are all autonomous and i think like this pod zero idea of putting all these light bars on there is a good step um but again i mean i want to know what they what the kind of trust elements that they measured were and then what was kind of the outcome from the study because it sounded like they were doing a, a study with both engineers and cognitive scientists behind it so it's kind of similar to what we do a lot of day to day so i bet you they're measuring some interesting stuff yeah for sure um I, that's the immediately what i thought of when i saw a cognitive scientist i was like oh well that's probably you know us might be people people like us i'm uh i'm looking for a video to post on <laughs> on the internet there uh so it uh, looks like we found one yeah, there we go. That thing is so cool. Look I just wanted to see zero. this thing in motion because, like, if you if you think about how this thing is actually operating, it's different, right? The projection has to adapt as the as the pod is moving, so that way, and like, what happens if in the middle of it the projection alters, right? Because, in at least in this video, it's highlighting something for me where this uh, it, it's projecting the path, but it's not following it. And I'm sure that, you know, it will be refined over time. Um, but the fact that it's not following the path it said it's doing, uh, it, it's just kind of indicating which direction it is going. It's not really projecting the path. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's kind of the same problem I had way back when we talked about this before. It, it is non, No matter how you look at this particular method, you're kind of going to have to rely on all people adapting and understanding what the different movements of light bars mean. Like the getting very close together, meaning breaking, going farther apart, meaning that it's going to be accelerating. Right. And what what it looks like to the it, right to the left. It's a whole communication language that has to be conveyed, and you know, while icons will do the same type of thing for, um, let's say, international visitors, you know, the signs with icons on mm -hmm. them. This has to be able to do the same thing. It has to be able to convey something across cultural languages, across a bunch of different factors. Right. Yeah. The people who can read, people who can't read. It has to be all conveyed right there. And then we have to get into our favorite thing, right, is like standardization across different vehicle types. Right. Because this is Jaguar testing out something in a specific electric car type, but what do you do across like other manufacturers? But like talking about your, uh, what was it, augmented glasses thing, I mean, that could work very well for icons, like things popping up, trying to indicate to you when stuff are moving into your periphery, if it's a car or whatever it may be. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, it's still a cool story, and I'm glad that they're actually testing it. But it does make me a little weary that, of course, it's being done. It's indoor testing, so what application are they really seeing for this outside? Yeah, um, and I mean, there are projection technologies that will allow you to see projection in broad daylight. Um, however, you know, it, it's it's not going to be the same type of contrast that you would get at night. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, okay, well, what's up next? Okay, so we got five designs to show how good design can actually make our world a little bit more inclusive. So design's a way of thinking of collaboratively to encourage new ways of thinking, as we all well know. User-centered design in its approach is design, design is inclusive by definition, encourages cross-disciplinary perspectives, and makes problem-solving an, an iterative process that would encourage new ideas and insights. So a multitude of global organizations from the World Bank all the way to Ford Foundation to Microsoft are turning to design to expand options for addressing healthcare, climate change, conflict resolution, and other complex challenges in our world. And in historic, this historic movement, when the attention of global leaders is directed towards building an inclusive society, Cooper Hewitt encourages everyone to engage in design's empathetic, optimistic promise. And so what this is, we've got like a list of five innovative designs from the Excess Plus Ability exhibition that's on display at Davos 2019. I'm assuming that's some kind of big tech conference. Um, yeah, if you're going, let us know. We'll be happy to have you on the show. Yeah, that'd be epic. I'd love to talk about this, especially this first one. So we've got five different, you know, designs uh, that have come up that are supposed to make the world a little bit more inclusive. And the first one up is a wheelchair called Rough 
by uh, Motivation Rough, and it's supposed to be like a rough terrain uh, wheelchair, something that can navigate through rough, unpaid, un- uneven terrain, which would be awesome because that just gives people a little, like, be able to go do something like we have here, like Tory Pines with a wheelchair. Um, and so you have it's it's got a like completely different design that allows you to actually navigate these kind of terrains. So I think this is probably my favorite one of the five. Yeah, the wheelchair. Uh, it, it's got. Uh, it, it, instead of the two wheels in the front like you'd normally see a wheelchair, it has this kind of uh, one wheel yeah, in it, the front. It, it looks very rugged, like off-roady. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like it has a lower profile to the ground, too, for lower center of gravity. If you're on uneven terrain, you want that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, the yeah. fact that... So so let me just talk about this article in general. So this this is a cool sort of look at, you know, what these innovative designs are bringing to the table um, to kind of highlight accessibility, right? We talked about accessibility, I think last week on the show for one of the uh, one, one of, of the, the Reddit ones, one of the Reddit questions, yeah, yeah. and we didn't really have a good answer because it's not something that you or I really designed to. We 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 you know designed for Navy users, and and that's a very specific demographic. We're not designing for the public, and we're not designing to be accessible. And so it's always cool to kind of see the other side of the coin, where some of this stuff out there is designed specifically for those who can't you know interact with things in the same way that 90 percent of the population can definitely yeah uh let's see here number two here the tablet toby dynavox i15 i don't even know what this is so this is a uh, eye tracking and speech generating tool and it's designed for people with reduced ability to speak and communicate uh so kind of like how i mentioned earlier was this on air or off air no you just mentioned it when we started the show okay yeah i don't remember uh but the people who can't like speak and and they have to get the brain chips um this is cool because it's using eye gaze and uh you know using that to be able to type on this keypad to communicate i think it's actually kind of makes it even more inclusive for like a more general population right because it's eye tracking instead of having to like either implant something or be you know under the care of hospitalization like potentially you could just have this and be carrying it around using eye gaze technology i wonder how accurate it gets over time because i'm sure like these companies to develop these guys i know toby's been around around a very long time for eye tracking machines and software so i bet you it's pretty great sure yeah and and the other key part of this is that it generates speech so you're not only typing into it but it's also generating output so that way other people can hear what you're trying to vocalize yeah it's it even tells that you can do like you're basically using the pointer with your eyes so similar kind of thing that we've seen before where people are able to move around a screen do anything from sending emails to actually editing videos or controlling even the lights and the doors in their house it's pretty sick right uh what's up next all right so we got something else from toby called gorilla glass so this is like infrared glass magnesium rear chassis oh goodness so here we go. Some designers and hearing aid users are transforming their devices into fashion statements with <laughs> and unique work. So this looks- I think you copied the wrong thing there. <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah, it's so this is actually a earring aid. An uh, earring aid. Bedazzled. That's pretty yeah, that makes more sense with yeah. the blurb. Yeah, it does. That's it? pretty cool. So <laughs> it's basically like putting bling on your hearing aid. Yeah, it is. Uh, to make, you know, basically no one feel like it's this uh, thing that makes you look like you are like you got hearing like you have some sort of impairment right like i don't know i i personally i kind of want a hearing aid because i feel like there's something up with my hearing there's like this constant buzz in my ear yeah that i can't it's in mine now too right? ever since i met I you know. yeah but so i think this would have been really cool like i don't know 10 years ago because my stepdad would refuse to get hearing aids even though he needed them badly because it was a vanity thing he didn't like the way that it looked or that it like showed that he had sure. anything in his ears or like there, there could be something wrong so something like this that maybe either made it you know more bling might have been good i mean if you get me something that makes me look like lobot from star wars i'm totally in for a uh hearing aid there you go you know you That's know who lobot is yeah yeah i do <laughs> Just it basically covers your ears. Good. Yeah, we'll we'll throw up an image. Uh, yeah, I, I I would love something. This is this is really cool. I really like this. Um, all right, what's up next here? So this is the uh, oh, this one's cool. The best. Uh, the magnetic shirt. Uh, for people who with limited manual dexterity, buttoning a shirt can be physically exhausting and frustrating, or even impossible. Uh, and you can see this kind of like with Parkinson's patients. Um. They, they have a hard time buttoning something or doing something with fine motor skills. And so the, the magnetic shirt basically allows you to button the shirt, 
just with magnets. And so um, that's what the closure system is, is uh, comprised of. And so this is making it accessible to those who lack fine motor movement. Yeah, or even as you get older, right, and you just have, yeah. like, bad arthritis and you can't, like, you lose motor function in your hands and stuff like that. Yeah, that's kind of like uh, button snaps. That's kind of like what those... I, I, I have to look at the history of button snaps, but I feel like... Uh, I feel like button snaps were created for um, those with, uh, you know, who who had difficulty buttoning things. That would make sense, right? Because now you're not like trying to do that maneuver where you're shoving it through the hole, or, or it's just more like maybe not on. created for, but but definitely adapted for shirts uh, that way. I'm not sure um, that, and apparently Western shirts, Westerns for sure. Uh, okay, what's the last one on the list? Last then? one is a map app, so it's called Access Now. So it's trying to create a more accessible world. As a person with most muscular dystrophy created the app, she knows that many people have a challenge in that they encounter when they're trying to determine whether a building is actually physically accessible. Now, this is super important, right? Even although most buildings should, I guess in the United States at least, should be you know accessible to people right. of any kind of disability. But at least this should help Pe- allows people to actually rate and talk about the status of what actually is this particular building's, you know, accessibility. Does it have a ramp? Does it not? Does it have an elevator? Those kind of things. Right. And, and um, is this like Yelp where it's crowdsourced or is it is it just some sort of database that they pull from? Uh, so it looks like it's an interactive crowdsource map. So people are actually at, like can pinpoint and put these ratings in about like whatever this building, a particular building has. Oh, apparently can't go to it. That's can't not good. go to it. All right. Well, anyway, it's an awesome concept, though. <laughs> awesome concept. Yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. Well, uh, yeah. Those are five design innovative ideas for accessibility, um, and it shows how the world can be more inclusive. Super awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we got a couple more stories. We'll be back to break those down right after. Uh, figure up this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Okay, we're back here. We're talking human factor stuff. Before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at New Atlas, WeForum, and TechCrunch, and the Brooking Institute for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all, uh, on all of our social media channels. Or you know what? A better place even to do that is on our Slack, because Mateo is posting there left and right. He is probably a better source for our news than we are at this point. Uh, so go go there for links to all the original articles. Um, so... Blake, we we pulled a couple of these today. Uh, what's up next? Ooh, this one this one will surprise very few, but also alarm many. I feel like this one might be a little controversial. It might be. I don't know though. We'll we'll see. Everybody, let us know how you feel about it. But we'll we'll get to get to the point. So, study has been found that kids two to five years old who engage in more screen time receive worse scores in development screening tests. The apparent ex- explanation is simple. When a kid in front of us is in front of a screen, they're not talking, walking, or playing the activities during which basic skills are cultivated. The topic is a thorny one, as there are plenty of arguments on both sides as to the pros and cons of screen use at an early age. And as with any other topic pertaining to parenting, it's immediately personal to many people and reliance on anec- anecdotes are common. It's only through studies like this one... This one, these and other researchers note that we can begin to understand or be sure of anything. And of course, we must study these studies as well. So Nick, this was a good pull on your part. And it, in a lot of ways, I think the opening line that it talks about is true. It's like it, it shouldn't really surprise anybody or it doesn't surprise most, but it still is alarming, right? Because if yeah, someone has to have 
a small child in their family somewhere or knows someone with a small child. Yeah. And the fact that they spend as much time in front of the screen that they do, this should be alarming. Yes. Yeah. So maybe. Maybe. But maybe Let's break not. it down. Because, uh, <laughs> I mean, did, I don't I don't really remember early childhood, but I assume that I spent a fair amount of time fair amount of time in front of the tv at some point yeah but when you were a kid i don't think screens were as readily accessible as they are now oh they definitely they, were they, but they they also weren't as interactive as they are now that's true too and that's okay so let's let's break down this article a little more so they're saying that um it kind of depends on the interaction that you're having right so sure. like there is a difference from you know a sibling building a fort in minecraft with their with their brother or sister um versus you know just watching a show in a passive way so they they do bring that to to attention that um it's directly impacting these sort of uh collaboration communication skills um and so you're right like there there are ways in which some of these technologies like video games might be more might be better in terms of um communication skills if it's uh if, if you're talking with others. If it actually is um, collaborative versus, like, me being off by myself playing Fortnite or something. Yelling obscenities about my mother. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, yes, right. Or or alternatively, if you are in Fortnite, you know, and and you're working collaboratively with a group to try it's to true. stay yeah. alive, right? Yeah. That might be. Yeah. I don't know how Fort, Fortnite works. Uh, so You know how <laughs> Fortnite works. Fortnite. Um, yeah, so uh, I think... There is uh, a lot to consider here, and we don't want to upset anybody by saying get your kids off the screen. No, um, cause I, I don't know if you can, right? Like, I don't know when kids start going to school, but I know at a young age, like, tablets are introduced in the school system now. Well, sure. Even even uh, my niece, who's, like, a year old, turning a year old this month, like, she is sitting in front of... Uh, and, and I think I... I um, you talked about this in the hospital, right? Like, yeah. a couple weeks ago? Yeah. Uh, I think this was on Infinite. And I don't remember, but yeah, I, I endorsed uh, Daniel Tiger, which is a spinoff of Mister Rogers' Neighborhood, um, because of the positive messaging it had, and and oh, that's sort right, of, yeah, uh, you know, all, all the stuff. Parents come back, uh, and so yeah, I mean, like being able to have that kind of stuff for kids, like I, I'm guilty of it. I put a screen in front of kids to pacify them. I literally pulled out my Nintendo Switch and said, "Here you go, play," so I don't have to worry about like babysitting you. So. I, I I don't know. I'm a bad babysitter, but still, uh, like I feel like there's got to be pros and cons on both sides, like the sure. article mentions. But I I do think there probably is a worry about some developmental skills if it's like so much time is spent just playing video games or just in interacting with the screen only. And actually, my my stepbrother brought up a really good point, and this is not necessarily well, maybe it was something that I wasn't really aware of. But young kids play, you know online interactive games from an early age yeah and so like the cooperation things there but you also have to worry about the implications of like predators being inserted into their lives oh yeah things like yeah, that yeah. and it was just so that from even an earlier age than like when we were when oh, i don't know about when you were but when i was getting on all, like on what was it america online like oh, aol Messenger. like yeah. seven years old yeah <laughs> just getting myself in all sorts of trouble asl but, uh seven seven <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, let's see here. They, they, they make sure to point out that kids with more screen time usually had lower scores, but kids with lower scores didn't, and this is like developmental screening scores, didn't necessarily have more screen time. So, um, they're, they're saying that screen time impacted it, but those with lower scores were not all due to screen time. Sure. Yeah, because so, there's too many variables probably to test for. Absolutely. And when you this is this is where it gets tricky and this is probably just me not doing enough research on the like our end looking at the developmental tests or looking a little harder at what the study is, but like I would like to know which developmental tests they looked at and like what because it's not like they're going to be like failing the de developmental test completely. I know it's made up of components and what are the things that they're struggling in or maybe if you see higher screen time, do you see lower in communication or something something to that effect? So that would be interesting to know. So the developmental outcomes, they measured them by the ages and stages questionnaire. Ooh. Um, remember that from developmental psychology? Yeah, I don't remember it personally, but uh, I know it's uh, well known. So they they basically just looked at screen time behavior over you know total hours of week 
uh, at ages two, three, and sixty months is five. So, so, so they're. Oh, ta- and they yeah. also ask the moms. It looks like. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it supports a direct directional association between screen time and child development. Um, but it, it looks like some of the recommendations coming out of this article are to encourage kind of family media plans as well as merging screen time um, to sort of offset these uh, consequences. Which I think is a, is a good way to go. I mean, there should be some like outside time. Some have to interact with human time and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just interesting to see because, I mean, kids these days, kids, oh, wow, uh, now I sound old. I just had a birthday. Now I'm sounding old. old. Uh, I mean, think about it, though. Like, they are exposed to things that children in previous generations had never experienced. Oh, yeah. Um, And it's it's good that we're studying this now to to measure the impact and kind of see how this affects how they grow up. It'll be interesting to see what these people are like as adults. Yeah. It's like a longitudinal thing. Cause that, yeah. that's, that's really where you're going to actually understand if there is any changes. Cause I mean, the other thing to think about is you and I, and I think a lot of people nowadays, we spend a lot of time even in, in our jobs interacting with technology. Right. I do even more so than people. Yeah. So is it, is it going to, and, uh, and you're a human factors engineer. Yeah. I'm a human <laughs> factors person and I don't really interact with people that much. Yeah. What gives? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like the computers, man. No. Um, so I wonder if that, if what it translates to, like in terms of career later on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or it doesn't have any, there's all these trade offs. There's all these trade offs. Right. Yeah. Th- and I think it ultimately, at least in my biased opinion, comes down to passive versus active media. And there are, there's obviously a gamut, right? There's like trash that you can feed them uh, for TV. Yeah. And then there's more positive messaging, like I mentioned. And then there's the interactive piece. But then that has a gamut, too, of trash to constructive to, like, Minecraft level where you're actually constructing something. It's like Legos. Yeah. Um, Versus, so, like, Call of Duty that's just yelling at obscenities at each other. At, at my mother. Yeah. I, so, <laughs> Blake, you're so guilty of that. Why, why are you <laughs> my calling mother. my mom out? She <laughs> listens to this show. You should be ashamed. I've never uh, even met your mom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, though I, I so there's a gamut, and I think it'll it'll be interesting to see how that breakdown um, is addressed over time. Most definitely, man. Yeah, uh, we got one Good last point. story, right? Do you have any closing closing thoughts on this one before I move on? No, I think I I have to say I agree with the title, and I would like to see what happens over time. Yeah, in terms of we agree, that, how negative is that correlation, or how bad is it? I guess. Agree. We got one more story. All right. So no one will be entirely safe from automation in the future, but according to a new study out of the Brookings Institute, around 25% of U.S. jobs are at high risk. So roles in transportation, food prep, production, and office admin are among those at the highest risk, with robotics and artificial intelligence threatened to automate in the neighborhood of nearly 70% of these tasks, according to the study. Activities involving processing, data collection, and physical labor are, unsurprisingly, at most risk here. So automation is expected to have an outsized impact in certain regions in the country and among well less well-educated workers. Likewise, it's expected to impact different segments of the population in very different ways. Yikes. Yeah. That's a downer to end on. But Yeah. You you asked for this. <laughs> yeah, I did ask for it and I was like, yeah, it's a good one. No, it's not. Well, <laughs> it's one of these things that I get really afraid for other people. Yeah. I mean, I'm afraid for my job at some point. Sure. Because, I mean, it's it's inevitable. AI and robotics could get to the point where they just don't need anybody to de- design things. It makes better choices than just regular people. Um, but the the thing that I think is not really thought about well enough is, or people just don't have the time to think about it because they're working, you know, 8 to 10 hours a day. They may have a family. They come home, just try and eat, go to sleep, and do it all over again. But yeah. how do you pr- plan and prepare for your job to be taken over by automation yeah, and not for the be transition. caught out. Yeah. Like, wh- what is there for that? And I think that's why I, I wanted to have this article in here is to mention that point. It's just I think there needs to be much more of a focus on what does transition look like for as many people as possible versus, like, just continually saying, automation's coming. It's going to take everything away. Yeah. Do you want to know uh, Do you want to know a spoiler and what the uh, predicted less, least impact of tasks that are susceptible to automation? Arts and entertainment. Nope. This is actually business. 
Really? Business. Business. What business is the lowest. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they define it in this article here. But they probably do. arts and entertainment is... Uh, and engineering's up there, too. Yeah, engineering, social service. So, hey. I mean, if you're listening to this program, chances are you're not going to be largely impacted by this in the next few years. Yet. Yet. Um, that's the big thing. Uh, going down the list, though, the, some of the most highly impacted... Um, uh, services or occupations, production, food service, transportation, administrative, <clears throat> maintenance, construction, agriculture. These are all at the higher end, although it kind of tapers off uh, starting with maintenance um, to where it's like a medium impact. But then then you get towards the bottom and you get the things like we already mentioned, as well as management, uh, science, computer and legal. So like these are all fairly safe and it's it's kind of cool to see them all on a graph there. You also have um, sort of a breakdown by metropolitan area and what they're focusing on. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and kind of um, the likelihood of, of more automation in those areas, right? So, like, take Los Angeles, for instance. We're looking at, like, a 45 to 46% um, share of tasks that are susceptible, right? Based on the industry of that city, uh, you can kind of anticipate what types of things. Um, so, like, Houston... They, they're at a 46.3. Um, really high in the production pr- pr- and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Pretty high in production. And then something like New York, uh, you're at like a 42% because of, you know, the type of business that happens up there. Sure, yeah. So, you know, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. And it's really cool. There's this interactive map. Um, you can see kind of where you're at or where you're thinking about going for industry. Um, and to see how much of it. Uh, what percent of the market share is going to be uh, likely to be automated. I think the good thing about the top three red ones, and I think that was transportation, production, and food service, as we've already seen, and I'm not I'm not trying to say this is a, this really is a good thing, but it's something that should be predictable because we've already seen like the introduction of robotics into all three of those and that result in job loss from that. So it's an industry where, even though it you may lose jobs, it's something that's already had to come to grips with, like technology coming in and changing it. So hopefully more people are aware, prepared for it. Right. Uh, so looking at this next chart here, this is average automation potential by age or race and ethnicity. Um, and this one is kind of alarming for age, right? Because if you think about it, the, it's the really majority, young. 49% of 16 to 24-year-olds, uh, they might be likely to be automated out of a job. And so if the workforce just coming in, I mean, that might push them to learn more skills. They're still young. They can adapt. Um, But you're looking at some of these other numbers. 25 to 54 is 40 percent. 55 to 65 is 41 percent. And then 65 plus is 40 percent. So not a whole lot of variation between those groups. But still, um, they're less they're going to be probably less likely to adapt because they've been doing a certain profession all their life. Um and it's going to be harder for them to kind of pick something new or, or learn something new yeah. when automation comes around. Yeah, definitely. Then you I also – oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you just have to – I don't know. You'd have to be so proactive, but that gets very tough in like – in I don't know, in the in American society where you spend so much time at work like outside of just a regular nine to five. You're spending more than that usually. And then, yeah. like, and then plus if you live in somewhere like California where you're commuting, I mean, you're losing hours in the day. Like, there, where are you supposed to budget this time to be able to obtain a new skill, especially in those higher age brackets, right? Yeah. And then they also break it down by race and ethnicity as well. Um, so overall, a really great report. Um, I, I, it's kind of uh, enlightening to see how exactly it's going to impact all these different industries and – you know, different places, people on the con- country. Everybody yeah. around the country, yeah. Yeah. Um, Intense. Yeah, so I guess one one major takeaway from this is that youth and less educated workers kind of, uh, along with un- unrepresented groups, are all likely to face significantly more acute challenges from automation in the coming years. Um, and uh, young workers and Hispanics especially will be expo- exposed to this risk. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, which is kind of, I don't know if now I feel old, but I feel like some of the jobs that I had that were more manual labor and like being a delivery driver, like 
I don't know. It taught me a lot of like time management skills and respect as a young oh, kid. Oh yeah. And so it was. I think it was important for my development. And I mean, honestly, I'm sure kids are probably be getting into better things than doing that. And like, I I know there's a lot more of like a, a age of younger entrepreneurs starting at like the 18 year old range than there was when I was younger. So who knows? But I just felt like some of those jobs that I was doing. It was a good thing. It was something I needed at the time. Not just the money, but like the the interaction with people, learning how to manage myself, and then oh, learn absolutely. to work with other people that you didn't necessarily get along with and stuff like that. And like, you know, having to get up at four in the morning to go to work, just that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, it, they're going to have to learn them somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a, a weird, wild world when we are interacting with automation I, especially the people who remember these professions before they became automated. You know, we're going to get people like you and me saying back in my day, uh, we didn't, you know, we, we ordered a pizza online and the person delivered it, you know, like the person came, the person came, like, you know, yeah, it's what's like a person where, whereas the generation before us is like back in my day, we used to have to call on the phone. We had to, to walk five miles yeah. in the snow both ways. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, that's it for the news stories. You ready to get into this uh, last little segment we like to call... It came from... It came from... It came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we take a look all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. What community? Well, my community, your community, the UX community, whatever all it over is. It. Any subreddit is fair game. As long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among this community meaning the Human Factors Cast listeners. All right, so we have time for a couple, but we only pulled one. Is that right? Yeah, only right. got one. <laughs> All right, so we'll just do the one, and then we'll be out of here. Um, and this one's by Lock on Coon uh, from the user experience subreddit. Um, they go on to write, what, what motivates you in your current role? For those of us who have been in the UX space or human factor space for a couple years, I'm curious to know what motivates you in your current role. At the moment, I've just transitioned from being the only designer in a slow-paced environment where I could work in a large number of projects to a big, well-known company where I'm working with a close-knit team on one small aspect of the big company's wide range of products. I'm curious to know what your motivations are for your current role or a role you want to be at in your next job. Blake, yeah, what up? Interesting. <laughs> that's that's a pretty intense change, and I can't can't really imagine how big of a shift that is. Going from working on multiple projects and something that's slow pace, that working in like a, a big mammoth where you're working maybe on a very small part of the feature. So that's that's probably a lot to swallow right there. Um, in terms of what keeps me motivated in my current job is if I can keep pushing myself to learn different things. Like recently, I've had to pick up a bunch of different design tools that I hadn't used before because it just made sense for the specific project. Uh, I'm kind of getting at this point to dictate how we do like quote unquote prototyping. I say that because it, it's very different when you're talking about an engineer versus like a UX prototype. Um, and so that's been fun because it's allowing me to experiment with different technologies that I got to use like in the freelance world, like web technologies and bring them into a fun kind of prototyping space not being totally worried that it's going to go directly into some kind of enterprise product, but it allows me to flex skills that I'm not like a professional at, which would be writing code, uh, but also flex skills that I am very good at. So my more, my human factors background. Um, but yeah, I think that's what motivates me in any role though, is if I feel like I'm continually either learning or that I'm growing in some way, whether that's like as a professional, as like a human being or as a manager or whatever it may be. Yeah, I will have to echo that statement. I think I'll add one more growth opportunity into that mix, and Do that's it. growth with learning about uh, the people that you're serving. I think y about your users, because uh, at least for you and I, we work on different projects, and so there are plenty of different demands between the projects and different users between the projects oftentimes. So learning about one user group might be completely different from another user group, and then kind of tying them all together at that high level is like, well, how does this play into that? Oh, I get it. There's the connection. That, to me, is also an additional p layer on that, that connection learning growth cake. Because if I can understand, um, the more I understand about the users, the more efficient I can do my job. Uh, and that's just one additional piece that I'd like to add. 
Yeah, it's kind of cool, especially if you're working. And maybe this applies to this person's situation where they're working on like a mega product. Is you may have a lot of different types of people that interact with it in different formats. You may have people that you know service a specific product that you build that are a third party company. You have your main maybe target user group, and knowing how those two different roles impact the use of the product or the needs of the product from two different sides is kind of a, a fun way to look at a problem. Yeah, uh, but I will echo your other points, though. Learning how to grow as an individual is a big one, too. Um, you know, uh, learning how to do your job more efficiently, effectively, learning how to adapt with the technology that's coming out, because you're not always going to be using... You might always be using Microsoft PowerPoint or something like that, but you might be using other tools that come and go sure. that fit your need at that time, right? Like you were saying, there are some very situational tools, and if you can learn how to use them, you might be able to use that knowledge in the future and say, oh, yeah, there's this thing that I used... I'm going to pull that back into this because it would fit the application. Yeah, most definitely, man. All right. Well, uh, anything else, Blake? That's all I've got, man. The Reddit was slow this week. That's okay. Well, if you guys have anything, you can always write into the show. Um, you can let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, we don't have an after show for you this week, but we will get back to you next week. Uh, for the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at A Tractors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support us, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, and, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorff, thank you for hanging out on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about automated vehicles projecting lights on the road? Oh, my goodness. You guys can find me to talk about automated vehicles projecting lights on the road at our Human Factors YouTube comment section. That's where you can find me. Hey, awesome. Uh, special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week, each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Be sure to tune into YouTube uh, every Tuesday around noon is when we drop these. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And until next time, it depends! It depends! think they'll ever automate this uh this podcast <laughs>